until we crossed, actually Kathy and I were driving separately. I crossed the Mississippi River, and that's kind of like, wow. Because it was up, you know, when we left home before, and now it's way up by the Mississippi. But those early morning hours are wasted sun anyway. So I, I wish we'd go to a double daylight saving time. Forget this morning. Thing. It'd be, look, 11 o'clock at night, wouldn't it be nice to have the sun up? Some of us. Let's pray. Lord, we, we ask that you will just help us discipline our, our minds. Lord, it's so easy when I read your word to just daydream and get done with 15, 20, 30 minutes of reading and not be able to remember a single thing I read. So speak to us this morning. Make, make these words um, come to life. And then, Lord, um, as much as we may need it, during this coming week, remind us of these words. Um, that we will not only know your Bible, but we will live right by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I don't regard myself as a real preacher at all. I just I just think of it more just a casual conversation. Um, you know, I kind of dominate the conversation, but just uh, really like we were just you know sitting around um, and just talking, and that that's the way I approach it. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom she was always trying to get us cultured. I kind of missed the lesson, but she she bought us this Time Life folk record set. Um, four records, and do you kids know what records are? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> four people. But, um, you know, you had to put one on, and then 20 minutes later, you had to put the next one on. And, um, but I remember one guy who kind of had a raspy voice. And of course, his folk songs. Um, I liked him because he started off, he says, you know, I don't like to really pretend I'm doing a concert. I just I just pretend I'm sitting on the back porch and you snuck up in the bushes and were listening to me play. Um, and I really enjoyed his, his music, guitar, uh, banjo. Um, and that was fun. But that's kind of how I feel up here. That it's just, I'm just telling you what I see here. Um, I'm not the scholar, but it's just applying it. But this section is one of those sections that we got the front speaker working, which then causes other problems. Um, but it's kind of nice. Um, this is one of those sections that when the people tell stories about the preachers, they like it when a preacher yells at the person sitting next to them. And you know, they can nudge them, you know, did you hear what he said? But there's some sections, and they'll say, you know, you got into meddling today. You got into areas you shouldn't have been dealing with because it hit too close to home. And this section of Ephesians, to me, is just a whole bunch of Paul meddling with us. It's like, give it up, Paul. Just, you know, let's move on to something else. Let's talk about my neighbor. Uh, you don't have to be talking to me. So we're going to read this last paragraph of Ephesians chapter 4. Um, and then we're just going to highlight a couple of the sections. We're not going to try to hit the whole thing. Um, you know, if you want to read it every morning, the coming this coming week, God God can hit you with the sections that apply to you. Uh, I'll just kind of highlight what unfortunately can apply to me. Verse 25 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer. But rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be 
kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The other day, I personally was thinking about this type of people, the, the youth over here at the beach. And it was interesting because I was thinking about them and I thought, we, we're telling them things not to do. We're saying, okay, you've got this Christian life now. You, know, you shouldn't be doing this, this, and this, and this. And yet I was stumped because I think to a certain extent we're failing them and we're maybe failing each other because we don't replace it with anything. And I think of somebody that just got fired from a job, rightly or wrongly, no matter what, they get fired and all they're thinking is about the job they just lost. And you go over to see them and they're talking about this, whether it was unfair and on and on. But let's just say four or five weeks down the road they get a new job and suddenly the old job is gone. And they, oh, this new company, it's great. I love working for them. And they're excited because they've got something to commit themselves to, something that focuses their attention. And I think with young people, even you know, with ourselves, I think so often we talk about the quit doing this, but we don't redirect it. And what do you do? What happens when you tell somebody to quit doing something? It's like that gets all their focus. And they get more angry because all they're thinking is they're not supposed to be angry, but you don't understand. And they can just recount to you all the wrongs that they suffered and they have a right to be angry. And we need to say, okay, this is what you should do instead. And this section of Ephesians, I find it amazing how he's giving the negative, quit doing the negative, and then Paul says, but there's a positive here. Like, take this first one. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. Speak the truth, each one of you. So it's not just, you know, quit being a hypocrite, quit lying, quit exaggerating. It's like, be truthful. And he gives us something to focus on. And so now when we talk, we can say, am I being truthful? Am I being honest? And so we aren't just fighting the one, but we're aiming for the other. And that, to me, helps because it takes the focus off the quit and changes it to what we should be doing. And Paul's saying, speak the truth one to another. You're, you're part of each other. You're part of a family. Get it together. Don't be dishonest with each other. And I think, you know, that starts, in my opinion, psychiatrists may have their own opinion, or psychiatrists, whatever is correct. I think being truthful starts with ourselves. And when we finally get honest with ourselves and start saying, you know, I have been doing this wrong. I have been holding this grudge. I mean, go through the next few things. You know, I, I've been angry. Um, I may not be stealing, but boy, I sure haven't been earning my paycheck. Um, we start to be honest with ourselves. And then we can say, you know, I'm going to continue that honesty. And I'm going to live so that when my neighbor looks at me, he knows that I am honest. Uh, I was just listening to one of the sermons I listened to of Chuck uh, Swindoll. And I've listened to it three times. That's, that's pretty bad when I listen to one sermon three times. Um, and I don't know much about Tom Landry. But Swindell said at his funeral, these big football players kept saying he was a man who walked what he talked. And they couldn't fault him for being two-sided. And they said he was truthful through and through. And I think that's how we need to be. So that you know, our spouse knows we're honest. Our kids know we're honest. Um, our friends know we're honest. And those that aren't Christians know we're honest. They, they can say, you know, if he says something, it, it's true. There's the chance, you know, we could just be wrong. But, you know, he's saying something with integrity. And so that, to me, that first little section, um, that's just a challenge to, to be honest with each other, with ourselves, within our family, um, at work, you know, at play, uh, whatever we do. Um, so that's just kind of the first little thing. I'm just throwing things at it, you know. If that applies to you, great. 
This next one, I'm not totally sure what he means. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. The closest thing I can say is even in a Christian company, there can be difficulties. And years ago, I was, to be honest, I can honestly say I, I was wronged in one decision. Um, the issue was I wanted to buy one type same machine, we're talking huge bucks, and somebody from outside the company came in and convinced the management to buy the other machine. And the one I was in favor of, well, of course, I picked it. It was better. Um, the truth is, money was the same. And weeks later, if not months later, I realized what we were deciding is between the two very best machines on the market. It wasn't like this was a make or break decision. This was like we ruled out everything else that didn't work, and there's only two machines left. In the end, you know, after that machine served us well for years and years, I don't know which one was better. I don't know if the one I wanted would have been any better or not. But I was really mad. Um, not, not to the, not in public. But it just turned inside me. And I didn't want to look at those people. And it just ate at me. And that's, that's what I get when I come to this. I keep reminding myself how I let it simmer and eat away. And even though I could justify it, and you get really good at justifying your anger, it just kept gnawing a hole. And there was a wedge happening. And it wasn't until September, um, I was, we were worshiping all the men of the company, fellowship, those of you that, you know, it's kind of a different situation. And I looked across the room, and I thought, you know what? We are both worshiping the same guy. And what am I doing grumping about a decision between the two best machines on this? And I just had to get rid of it. And I thought, how easy it is to maybe take something that, you know, at first is right, or even if it is right. You see somebody beating his family. Um, it is right to be angry at sin. But we can't stay in that. We need to do something with it. We need to commit it to God, ask God to move, or maybe go talk to somebody in truthfulness and say, you need to stop this. Um, different situations may have different ways to solve, but we need to get past it and really lay it at God's feet. Um, otherwise, sin does creep in. And what happened to me was soon every decision the management made was bad. Because they wronged me, so every single decision they made was bad. Let me tell you, they weren't making bad decisions. It was just that I had these blinders on, and I was so hardened about it. Um, and I think that that kind of, you know, jumping ahead um, to that last thing, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, um, along with all malice. Um, it's so easy to get in that pit of despair. Blame it on somebody. Um, but what does Paul do? He says he's, he's got a, a solution. Just don't let the sun go down. You know, take care of it. Deal with it. Whatever you think you're supposed to do, deal with it. The last phrase is be kind to one another. It's like, you, know, you, you start putting effort to be kind to one another. You don't have time to be mad anymore. Um, because this is going to take effort. Um, and then you're going to see new reasons why. It's tough to be kind. But you start saying, how can I work out God's love? Um, how can I show people that God is at work and God loves them and God's merciful? Even if they're wrong, we say, I could have been there too. Um, last week, listening to Teen Challenge, um, some of those testimonies, it's like you realize, boy, now, I don't know all our backgrounds, but my home life was pretty good. And you realize, it's only God's mercy that put me in the home I grew up in rather than the home some of these.